Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. It's an exciting day today. We have Marilyn and Paul Brettlinger, the founders of Crop King, who are going to explain to us what we need to know about hydroponics, a wonderfully exciting way of growing food, plants, and we're going to understand the distinctions between organic and non-organic. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Marilyn and Paul Brettlinger to It's Rainmaking Time. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, and thank you. Talk to us about what have you been doing for 27 years? Why did you go in this business? Um, during our college days, we were initially introduced to hydroponics. My former husband, Dan Brettlinger, and I, we owned two small greenhouses that we grew tomatoes in in a very old and kind of archaic growing system where we had beds of peat moss um, and tomato plants in them, and it was a difficult system, but that was our first introduction to hydroponics. Why did you do it, though? Initially, it was we were very enthralled with greenhouses, and this was a greenhouse that was available for sale in Springfield, Missouri, where he was a student. And that was our we bought those greenhouses and and uh, got our feet wet in hydroponics. Explain what it is, Marilyn. Hydroponics is a method of growing without soil, so you eliminate all of the pathogens that may be in soil and some diseases. But, but more than that, you don't have to be in an area where you have good soil to be able to produce a vegetable or a fruit. You simply need to have um, fertilizers that you suspend in nutrient enriched. You, you suspend these fertilizers in water and the plants don't have to work hard to get it. Um, but there are a lot of different methods of hydroponics. Hydroponics is generally growing without soil in water. In a way, when you think about it, it seems otherworldly. Like, how do you grow plants not in soil? We're so used to soil-based growing. Is that part of the perception that keeps many people from participating in hydroponics? I think one of the perceptions that keeps people from participating in hydroponics is their concern that maybe it's some kind of weird chemicals that we're growing our plants in. What we're actually growing our plants in are all of the elements that you would find if you had perfect soil. They have been reintroduced into water, and then the plants are fed with that nutrient-enriched water. What kind of elements are in the water? Give an example of it, if you would. Well, the calciums and the, the, all the micronutrients, the irons, everything that you would find if you could find the perfect soil. And perfect soil for one crop is not necessarily the same soil that's perfect for another crop. So you can adjust different levels of different nutrients in the soils for specific plants. Do you buy those nutrients separately and introduce them into the water, or are you saying it comes from the water directly? The water does have some nutrients in it, and that's one of the advantages that Crop King offers is that we actually look at what you have in your water and we enhance anything that's not in it. You know, some people have a lot of calcium already in their water, so your fertilizer mix would be made with a little bit less calcium because you already have it in our, for instance, you know, you have iron in your water. So your fertilizer mix would not contain as much iron as someone else who didn't have that already existing in their water. Is this a science? Absolutely, it's a science. Talk about that. Well, we're basically uh, the greenhouse. I mean, what, what we do is uh, control environment agriculture. So when we control the environment, it's basically what we're trying to do is mimic a lab setting where we control exactly what the plant gets through for, you know, force feeding it with the proper nutrients and giving it exactly what it needs so it doesn't have to expend energy going out and looking for them and extrapolating them from the soil. It's, it's readily available in an easily uptakeable form. Uh, directly to the roots. Now, Crop King is a commercial uh, hydroponics you all, you training environment, and also you provide the equipment. Correct? That's correct. We offer. We've had a horticulturist on our staff, Jim Brown, and he's one of the people who's uh, early in. The, he's Jim's been around since early times in hydroponic production, and he's our horticulturist. And um, we offer training schools that Jim teaches. Um, and ongoing technical support. If someone buys a greenhouse package from Crop King, a hydroponic greenhouse package, 
we're available for issues that they may have. They say, you know, my leaves look a little yellow or I have this particular bug or and those are the kind of things that we try to support our growers in. Why should people turn to hydroponics or consider it? Well, because they may be in an area where they're, they don't have good soil for growing crops or they don't have good rainfall, and that's what the controlled environment does for you. It doesn't matter what your soil is like or what your environment is like. If you can control it inside a greenhouse, you can produce these different crops. I think that's a good question um, that should probably be expanded on a little bit as far as you know, why should people look into hydro or why should people go with hydroponics as a form of f- producing their food. Not everyone should. I think that's one of the misconceptions that is being presented out there with the with the attention that hydroponics is drawing across the the country from you know New York Times articles to Time Magazine rating hydroponic systems to the uh, financial industry investment conferences that are related specifically to agriculture that are dominated with the new hydroponic systems that are coming out. It's becoming such a buzzword that so many people, just like every buzzword, fad, huge push of media attention does to anything, everyone will jump into it and try to you know, make money off of it being a buzzword. Not, hydroponics won't work for everybody or in every situation. Some places it just doesn't make sense to have hydroponics. If we have ample amount of farmable land that will produce good quality products, it's not necessarily going to be a great solution in that specific region. Um, But as we have less and less land or as we deplete the soil that we do have, it's going to become more and more necessary as it, you know, as it continues to move into the future. But one of the things that is somewhat frustrating being a company that's been in this industry for 27 years is the muddiness that's happening as far as what works and what doesn't work. So, for example, people that have some land or have a home who have been inspired or excited and motivated to have their own hydroponics area where they grow their own food, I realize that you're a commercial well, right. Company, Certainly, for but... the hobbyist, it's a completely different, a completely different situation. If someone is interested in it as a, <clears throat> as a hobby and wants to, you know, grow their own lettuce and tomatoes and things like that, certainly it's a, a viable option. Um, a lot of people will come to us though, and they want to do that because they want to save money, you know, over going to the grocery store and buying, you know, buying their own produce. It's not going to be a money-saving thing on a hobby scale. Um, there are benefits as far as you knowing where your produce is coming from, knowing what what's been sprayed on it, knowing that there's no harmful pesticides on it from you know getting it from a grocery store that got it from a farmer that's uh, fifteen hundred miles away. But as far as doing it to you know save money from avoiding going to the grocery store to buy lettuce, it's not going to save you money. Um, but on a commercial scale, the benefits you know obviously it's a different set of pros versus the, the hobby side. Are there a lot of commercial hydroponics companies out there? I have to define a lot, you know. There. Well, and what is what do you mean by a commercial company? Are you like in other words, provide the products or companies that grow the produce? Companies that grow the produce. Um, Well, I would say that Crab King services hundreds of them, and we, you know, we probably don't service all of them. Small growers around the country who might be a farmer who've added, uh, you know, a small commercial system that they sell locally within a 100-mile radius. And, um, and and again, that's the advantage to hydroponics is that your food, we're not talking about shipping it across the country. We're talking about selling it right around the area that it's produced. So it's local food. The majority of all of our growers are pesticide-free growers because we use something called biological pest control, which means that you put in one type of bug to eat the other bugs that you have. You put in carsey in to eat the white fly that you may have in your greenhouse. So we avoid in spraying any kind of pesticide in the greenhouse. So you can get a locally produced, pesticide-free product, and that's what consumers are looking for today. In an earlier conversation, you were sharing about how there's this confusion also with hydroponics that just because you grow food in a hydroponic method doesn't mean you haven't shipped it a long way or radiated it, et cetera. Explain it. Right. And hydroponic production is just a method of growing food, just like growing it out in your garden is. 
Um, but a hydroponic tomato can produced a long ways away from you, for instance, up in Canada or down in Mexico, and you're shipping it to the East Coast, that produce is not very fresh by the time that you've received it, and their criteria for a good healthy or a good tomato is one that they can drop from three feet without damaging it. Well, that certainly doesn't speak to it tasting good. What they do is they pick them green, they put them in a truck, and they gas them on the way to their destination so that they're ripe when they arrive. And I think a lot of people get that thought by buying a tomato that simply says hydroponic on it in the grocery store. They taste one, and it doesn't taste like anything more than those old hothouse tomatoes that we used to get that everybody complained about in the, minor, in the middle of the winter time. That's because they are. They're the same thing. They're there are tomatoes that have been grown in a greenhouse using a hydroponic growing method, but they still weren't ripened, and they were still shipped a long way to get to you. Um, they were only ripened artificially, so the fruit didn't make it. The, the sugar didn't make it to the fruit, and therefore they don't have a flavor, a good flavor like a, a garden tomato that you picked ripe, and the fruit's already gone from the plant to the fruit. So it's not the growing method, it's whether the plant was was grown locally, harvested locally, and made it to your grocery store in a ripe condition. That's really important. For example, I shop at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's out here. I try to get to the local farmer's markets. But when I go to Trader Joe's, for example, the fruit is from all over the world. Right. It's not necessarily local every now and then you'll find something local and then there's a whole question is is it genetically modified i don't know there's a whole other sticker for that it's getting more complicated to sort that when you go to a traditional market absolutely and that's it's getting to know your farmers your local farmers and and that's why sometimes i wonder if the hydroponic label is even as important as it is to be able to say this is a locally grown product it was ripened naturally and it's pesticide free and, and that's, I think, the buzzwords that con- today's consumer is looking for. And you're seeing more of that. You know, I mean, it, it was the organic push, and organics was just huge. And, and it still is a big market. And, and what's happening now is the big, big players in agriculture are getting into the organic market, and so it's kind of losing some of its Luster. appeal. Um, when, you know, like you said, when you go to Trader Joe's and you buy an organic radish, that was still grown in California and shipped 1,500 miles away. You know, I mean, is there really much benefit to that as opposed to if you were purchasing local radishes where you knew the farmer and you knew that he didn't use pesticides and you knew where it was grown, et cetera, et cetera. I think that more people are actually looking for that than they are for just some generic label that's, you know, governed by a body that, you know, is some unknown saying this is what is organic and this is what's not organic. Um, I think that the the local food movement or the slow food movement is is gaining popularity on the organic movement. Well, and again, even with organics, it's it's what is the entity that is governing to say that it is organic. Some of them are a percentage of organic. Well, what percentage of them isn't organic? Does that mean, you know, you're allowed to spray some pesticide in there? Um, organic in Mexico may mean something very different than an organic product grown in Ohio. Yeah. You mean there's no organic standard across the board? No, no there is, but it's governed by a, a government organization that's determining what is and isn't allowed to be used you know, for organics. Whereas when the organic movement started and when people fell in love with organics, it was governed individually, locally by certifying agents who were local, and it was more of a local movement that got a name called organics than it was today when it's, you know, the OMRI or these large certifying agencies um, governing organics, you know, it was... If you look at your organic label, though, there are percentages, there are still different ways that it can be called organic, so you need to really inspect what it says. Is it an OMRI certified organic product? Right, is it an organic product or is it made with organic products or does it contain organic products? It's not necessarily just organic. I understand that the enzymes in soil and in most foods are gone now unless you are eating something fresh, you don't get the enzymes. Is that your experience as well? I don't know a lot about that, I guess I'd have to admit. 
That's one of the benefits of eating fresh fruits and vegetables well, is that been. they're nutrient dense and they still have the enzymes contained in them. Right, they've not been heated or cooked or but you have different levels of vitamins in there depending on how fresh it is or how ripe it is, you know, more vitamin C in something. For instance, a green pepper has much less vitamin C in it than a red or an orange pepper has. Because I didn't know that. A green pepper is an unripe pepper. And I think that that probably has more to do, though, with its with its age, etc., as opposed to its, its, the form that how it was grown. Because regardless of a plant takes up organic nutrients or synthetic nutrients, it's processing them the same way. It will convert them to organic nutrients. Except for, in the case of a lettuce leaf, when a lettuce leaf takes something up and then you eat the lettuce leaf before it's converted it to organic matter, you're eating it however it took it up. So, for instance, in organic systems the form that the fertilizer is when the lettuce plant took it up, you know, like the the wild pigs that went to the bathroom on the lettuce out in California and people got E. coli from it. It's because the lettuce plant, the leaves have not had the opportunity yet to convert them to organic matter before you're consuming them. In the case of a fruit, like a tomato or an apple or something, it's gone through the whole process before it makes it out to that piece of fruit. And at that point, they're all organic. Isn't this a timing-based system as well? You can ruin a plant by not timing things properly. Am I correct about that? In that, instead of it getting it from nature, you're providing it through a pump that's pumping water and and nutrients to it or heaters as opposed to, you know, the sun outside. You know, you're growing in the springtime because that's when it's warm. Well, in a greenhouse, you're growing in the winter and you're providing heat. So a timing in that if something goes wrong... If there's a malfunction, then yes, you don't have the same buffer as you do from growing a garden outdoors in, in Mother Nature's conditions. Um, but By the same token, you have more buffer because Mother Nature may freeze the produce where you can keep it warm in your greenhouse. Right. Assuming that your equipment is all working, it, it, it isn't an issue. But that's the only timing I can think of. It's not necessarily a timing of on day four you have to... Yeah, I can't really think of timing either that was... Planting timing, but again, that's going to be the same inside or out. There's a lot of new up-and-coming companies that are calling themselves sustainable and trying to work in urban environments to establish vertical hydroponic systems. What do you think of that? Vertical growing is certainly an interesting concept. Being able to put more plants in the same space sounds like a good idea. The reality of that is a very different thing. It's been a lot of years ago that we had a a greenhouse size, a 30 by 128 foot greenhouse, that we used to put a thousand plants in it. And we did some research on it, and what we came up with was by planting 870 plants in that same space that we used to put a thousand, we got exactly the same production. Each plant produced more fruit than when we had more of them crammed in there. So it saved us time and labor and money for cost of materials to plant that many more plants. And so then it was more profitable by putting less plants in the same greenhouse. It's kind of the same thing with vertical systems. When they try to stack more plants in there and put them on top of each other, there's only a limited amount of sunshine and and. CO2, and all the things that plants need to help them grow. It's not just being able to give them the fertilizer they need. They need to be able to convert that food into actual plant production by photosynthesis. So these vertical systems, what they tell you is, well, you can rotate them so each plant gets an equal amount of sunshine. And that's true. They might get the equal amount of sunshine, but it's still less sunshine than if they had enough space where they could all receive the sun all the time. So stacking them up does not mean that you're going to get more or better production. That's interesting because it seems to be heavily touted in sustainable industry and in the... Well, and that's that's what I was going to say. I mean, Marilyn, I think, hit on it. It's interesting. It's it's very cool. You you look at the New York Times or Times Magazine, you see these 
high rises with all these futuristic looking uh, models of how we're going to grow plants and there's going to be animals on this floor and fish on this floor and it's all going to be interconnected. It's very, very cool and, and fun stuff to talk about and discuss, but I think that what we all need to be careful of when we're looking at this and, and trying to figure out how are we going to grow and, and support the, the growing needs of fresh fruit in our country is where's the proof like that it, that it is. Like We can talk about it, but I think that if we're looking for what works, we need to look what has a history history of working and and providing food all over the world. I mean, the U.S. is so far behind the world technology when it comes to growing hydroponically. It's it's silly. I mean, you look to to Holland, you look to New Zealand, you look to Australia, and all of these countries have a much more unified hydroponic sector um, that has been doing this for, for many, many, many years, providing the majority of their fresh produce. Um, and it's not by going vertical. It's by utilizing the land and growing in the most efficient way. Um, and, and so, again, here in the U.S., we're very uh, ADHD. And so any, <laughs> any pretty new little thing that's shiny is going to make us turn our heads. Well, I think the, we just the need vertical to be very grower, careful. The vertical grower is the answer to the, what we just said, too, will be, well, you can put lights on it. And, and lights are a huge thing. We hear from people every day who want to grow hydroponics inside some old building. The reality is you could knock that building down and put a greenhouse there, and in the end you would save money by using the natural sunshine by rather, than, rather than trying to replace the natural sunshine with artificial lighting, which is the answer that you'll hear from a vertical grower. Well, we'll just put artificial lighting on it. You've got to look at the cost of not only the expense of those lights, but the operation of the lights, the replacement of the bulbs, and, and, and the and the quality of the products you're going to get from growing under artificial lighting. There's a lot of research and a lot of money being spent on artificial lighting. And someday we may reach that point where we can grow 100% under artificial light and do a better job than under the sun. But it, it currently isn't available, and the technologies that they're experimenting with are ridiculously expensive, and it will be many, many years before the cost of those come down if they are the answer. Um, so what, what we're saying isn't that it just can't be done. It just can't be done efficiently, cost-effectively, profitably now. There are many places in the world now, I've done a lot of shows on climate and weather, that are suffering from cold. It's interesting in this supposed context of global warming, they have seen record-breaking cold weather around the world. And in in China, thousands of miles of crops were damaged, pig farms, all kinds of plant life that was ruined, and obviously in other places in the world when you have inclement weather like this. And so maybe in some places of the world, hydroponics could be a backup solution because the weather is erratic and unstable and too cold and depend on traditional growing methods. So in that case, maybe they use full spectrum lighting, which is like the sun, and they do produce something indoors with not artificial, but full spectrum lighting or something better until they can grow something outside. And what do you think about that? When I say indoors, I'm, uh, my other alternative would be in a greenhouse, which allows the sunshine to come through. I'm talking about a, a building that's got walls and a roof on it that people want to convert to a growing Oh, I see. Okay. Space. You compare that to the cost of putting up a greenhouse, which a greenhouse structure is fairly inexpensive, and it's allowing all that free sunshine that's right there above, you know, in the sky to come into the greenhouse without a cost of using electricity to create that light. What if, for example, someone puts together a greenhouse like you're describing and they have erratic weather where they don't get enough sun for the plants to be growing properly, how would you know if they needed to add something else to make it grow? It would be my suggestion in that case then that what they have to take a look at is what is their electric rate. You know, we, we know how much light that you need to supplement sunshine. And, and to several growers across the country, we suggested that why don't you put up a couple bays with lights and figure out what your costs are and how much more production you get in your area by having supplemental lighting. And that's the only way you can tell yourself whether it's practical or not to do that. 
are you getting enough extra production out of those greenhouses to pay for the lighting costs of, of operating the lights as well as the cost of purchasing the lights and then maintaining them? Do you Have you increased your production on food enough to pay for that? Do you find that most people don't know what they're getting into when they come to you? I think a lot of people have a lot of romantic ideas of how wonderful it will be to have a greenhouse and grow food and spend time in the greenhouse. And all that's really nice, but there's a lot of labor involved in it, too. And you're running a business, and it's not something that you do when it's fun or when it sounds like a good idea. It's something you have to be in your greenhouse every day. I will tell you something that's a legitimate concern that I've been noticing in conversation. People have a growing concern, no pun intended here, that food costs are escalating and food quality is diminishing and they are concerned they want to be able to have their own food. How much does it cost for a person to establish a greenhouse with hydroponics and give us an example of something full scale? I'm not trying to pin you down to cost because it depends how much equipment they get. Are you talking about a commercial operation or, or something for somebody in their backyard to supply their family. Do you have an option for that? We do sell a a range of of smaller greenhouses called our sanctuary line. Um, They range from, I think, 12 by 12 up to 18 by 28. And, you know, you can put up a a relatively, we would consider those to be relatively small greenhouse structures and and put, um, you know, heating, cooling, uh, environmental controls, et cetera, into that. And I think a, a 18 by 28 is probably somewhere in that $6,000 range for heating, cooling, environmental controls, and probably the structure. A little, more, a little more than that, I would say. If you How much could be grown in that? Let's take an 18 by 28. We don't really. I mean, there isn't anything that we've said you can produce X number of pounds out of that, but you could more than amply create a, a, enough fresh lettuce and and tomatoes or cucumbers to, you know, to, to supply probably the majority of a family's needs of fresh produce. And that kind of is like if you put out a garden that's, you know, 10 by 20, how much produce you're going to get out of it. It's how intensively are you everybody. planting it? What, you know, what, what are you growing? Things like that are all going to play into it. But that's a nice sized hydroponic system. I mean, just a small, uh, our greens, leaf and greens kit that we have, we have a small, that's, uh, what is it, six channels, Marilyn? Um, I believe it is, six four-foot six channels. Six channels that have six spots, so it's 36 heads of lettuce can be, you know, if the whole thing is planted out at the same time. Um, and, you know, if you're, growing that under an artif- space, yeah. if you're growing that under an artificial lighting, you, you know, you could probably get, indoors under artificial lighting, you're probably going to get 12 crop rotations out of that a year. So if you could harvest 36 heads of lettuce um, every month, you know, you could eat a head of lettuce every day. Amazing. But as far as a commercial system, I right. mean, they range from small, our smallest commercial system is 30 feet wide and 128 feet long. A 30 by 128 foot greenhouse, which is our smallest commercial greenhouse, will hold 6,192 plant spaces or heads of lettuce at one time. You'll rotate each one of those spaces about 12 times in a year, which means that that greenhouse over the course of a year could produce 74,300 heads of lettuce. And that's our small commercial greenhouse. They go up from that to something we call a gutter connect greenhouse, where each bay is 22 feet wide and 128 feet long. 16 bays is an acre. In an acre of lettuce production, you would produce 74,000 heads of lettuce at one time. And again, each plant position in the greenhouse, and there's 74,000 of them, you could rotate it 12 times a year. So you're going to produce over 800,000 heads of lettuce out of an acre of hydroponic. That's extraordinary. How exciting. you know, and in a system like that, something that will produce, you know, 800,000 heads of lettuce a year, you're looking at somewhere, um, a cost of equipment, uh, about $650,000. Now you've got to build it after that. So by the time you get it all built and you can 
construction costs and your concrete walkways, you know, you're going to have probably somewhere around a million dollars in it. But worth it if you want to supply locally, correct? Right, and that's a pretty good sized, you know, obviously over 800,000 heads of lettuce in a year, um, you need to have a fairly good population around you to be able to uh, have a market for all that lettuce. Talk about the history of hydroponics. Did it come from England and France? Well, I think the history of it goes all the way back to Bible times in the, the, I believe, the gardens of Babylon, that they surmised that they were hydroponic back then. Um, did it come from France? I'm actually not sure what the what all the history is. I more know the history of. I think they appeared in France and England during the 17th century, and also I guess the Roman Emperor Tiberius during the first century. Probably been around for thousands of years. I would agree with that. Maybe in one form or another. The history in the U.S. and in. Uh, is more what I know, and, you know, back 30, 30 years plus years ago, we were growing in peat moss and perlite and in beds, and it was difficult to avoid a lot of the diseases that no longer bother us. Um, I know tobacco mosaic was one of the big problems 32 years ago when we had a greenhouse, or botrytis. Now, botrytis is still out there. You almost never hear of anyone getting tobacco mosaic in their tomato greenhouse anymore because the varieties have been bred. Um, there are uh, tomatoes that have been bred to resist those kind of diseases. There are greenhouse varieties that come out of Holland, and those are the greenhouse varieties that Crop King sells. You can buy inexpensive tomato seed, but if you want to make sure that your seeds are some of your least expenses, and you want to make sure that you get a good seed that's going to be resistant to diseases. Is that a GMO seed? I'm not sure what a GMO seed uh, is. A genetically modified seed? Oh, uh, no, it's a hybrid. What does that mean? I don't understand. We take uh, two different varieties. You wouldn't want to take the seed out of a hybrid seed. You wouldn't come up with the same kind of tomato again because they take two different varieties and mix them together or multiple varieties and, and, you know, pollinate one type of plant with another one. It's a seed that's bred for different resistance to be, you know, to grow with the resistance to different diseases or to different pests or to have uh, specific traits that are, you know, attractive to us, you know, as far as big fruit or a good taste, things like that. They're, they're bred for specific purposes, creating, you know, making it a, a hybrid seed. Um, when you when you grow a hybrid seed, the seeds that it produces in the fruit are not necessarily um, they going could to go produce back to the one same uh, right. plant that you got the first time around because they're not they're not the original into seed. horticultural things that we yeah. <laughs> that we're not the experts on. No, absolutely not. What about yeah. bugs and bacteria and people's concern for that on a larger context since it's organic, right? It's not organic. Uh -uh. It's not? Hydroponics is not organic. Um, again, because we're back to you have to follow the rules of, of the OMRI standards um, to be considered organic. But And so if you, even if you were to use completely organic nutrients, if you're using rock wool, which is the medium that majority of our growers use, rock wool is not able to be certified organic. So even though it's an inert media that we're growing in, that precludes us from being able to label it as organic. Wow. Um, but there are other medias yeah. that, that are organic that you could use and, and label yourself organic. Um, but no, just we, we're, using, we're using synthetic fertilizers. Um, you know, we're using calcium nitrate and um, potassium nitrate and magnesium sulfate and things like that to, to go in and feed the plants. But that's what I was saying earlier as far as the plant's going to utilize you know, magnesium sulfate or potassium nitrate, just like it would utilize the same elements coming from an organic source um, once the plant takes it up and turns it into a tomato. Isn't part of the fascinating nature of hydroponics that you're saving water also that would normally run off everywhere in soil 
Correct me about that if I'm wrong. Absolutely, that's true. In our NFT system, which stands for nutrient film technique, that's the method that we use for growing small leaf crops in a channel, that nutrient is in a tank that's buried underground, so it's not evaporating from there. And then it's, it's fed through the channel. The plants take up exactly what they need, and the excess returns back to the tank, and it's constantly circulating like that. When you would water that same plant outside in the soil, a lot of the water that you put on the plant is going to you know, leach right down into the ground pretty quickly, and you're only going to take advantage of a small amount of it that the plants can take up, and you'll have to continually water. In a hydroponic system, the only thing that the only water that you're losing is what the plants actually take up and transpire. Can we talk a little bit about solar? Do you use any solar panels or are you involved in any way in helping people set up a solar enhanced hydroponics growing system? Everybody wants to talk about solar, and it's, you know, again, it's another one of those things that in the future there's probably going to be some applications, but the cost of solar panels still preclude it from being an an economically viable option for our main customer. Now, again, I think you have to realize our main customer is the mid-sized grower. We're not selling to the guys who are setting up 40-acre ranges or 100-acre ranges or even 20-acre ranges. Could someone who wanted a 20- or 40-acre range, could you design for them? They're not going to come to us. They're, 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 you're talking uh, ranges where they're coming from a, a Dutch company. No, it's just not what we do. Um, but when you're talking about our size of grower, who is that family farmer who's looking for that you know, quarter acre up to five acre range, that's where we fit in and where we can assist people and that there's benefit to working with a company like us who puts packages together. When you're talking about a 40-acre project, the economies of scale, typically it doesn't make sense to go to somebody that's going to help you put that package together. You're just going to hire someone who's going to put that package together. Um, But when it gets to our size of grower, it's just not cost-effective to try and utilize solar panels. However, everyone's like, oh, are you guys using solar? A greenhouse is solar. Like, that's the best definition of solar. We're utilizing the sun to its fullest extent to grow plants by putting it in a greenhouse. So the the whole operation is a solar operation. We're not using solar panels. Um, Right. A greenhouse is a solar operation. We take advantage of the sun coming, and that heats the greenhouse. Um, We actually have to put shade cloth on in the summertime to keep from heating the greenhouses up too much. But in the winter months, on a warm, sunny day, the sun heats that greenhouse up so much that you don't have any need for your heaters to come on. Crop King's focus is on the economic viability of small commercial farmers. Our goal is to set people up to be profitable. The idea of supplying huge urban population with with food um, isn't what we're focused on. We're focused on supplying populations with food where the grower can make a profit in doing so. And so I think that you know a lot of the technologies that are coming and that are, that are getting a lot of press are extremely efficient and very earth-friendly, but they're not necessarily economical or profitable for a grower. So they're, they're just not going to fit into Crop King's business model until they come down to that range. And I think that that's one of the benefits that people get with utilizing a company like us is that we're looking out for your ability to make money in this venture. What about designing hydroponic systems for farmers that are in locations that have erratic or destructive weather patterns that might want to work with you but don't want to depend on the sun in their area many, many months of the year because of the weather is that something that if it were five acres or under, you might consider still? As far as what? Well, that they purchase the hydroponic systems from you. They learn how to operate them from you, but they do put solar panels because of uh, where they are absolutely. at. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, we're, we're in this to make money, so we'll sell any of our products to anybody. Um, if we don't think what you're doing is going to be successful, we'll let you know. 
<laughs> profitable. And we do tell but, people but that. But we'll still sell you the products if you want to send us money for them. I mean, that's where it comes out. I mean, we're not going to refuse to sell somebody something because we don't think it's going to be successful, but you will definitely know that we don't think it's going to be successful. You were saying something, Marilyn, that you tell people what? We will tell them all the time that we can help you do this, what you want to do. Whether that is a profitable thing to do, to do or not, we also let them know that. For instance, we have people who say all the time, oh, I want to put this on the roof of a building and I want to do this or I want to do that. And we'll say, well, sure, we know how to do that. Will you make money by doing that? I'm, I'm sure that the structure that you need to reinforce is going to make buying a little plot of land out somewhere much a much cheaper uh, resolution to what you're looking for. But can we help you do what you want to do? Sure we can. Is it, it profitable what you want to do? No, not necessarily. Got it. We're very glad you're there. And we, we I mean, we supply, I would say, you know, inclement weather or places where they have bad weather. Jamaica is obviously hurricane central. Um, and we've got a number of, of growers on Jamaica who utilize Crop King, not only our, our hydroponic growing systems, but also our greenhouse structures because we build a very strong beefy greenhouse that's going to stand up to that kind of, of, uh, of those kind of conditions. And so there are places that where they have very unpredictable weather that ha- they have to deal with who are utilizing this. And, and the biggest thing is, as opposed to solar power or solar panels, you need to have a, a good supply of, of electricity or power. And again, we're, we're supplying water to these plants with pumps. So if, you, if you're out of power, um, it becomes a, a large issue. So we typically just suggest a, a, a generator that's sized properly in order to continue to run and operate the items that you will need to have in the event of a power outage. Do you sell generators as well or recommend no, them? No, but we, we can, not, we we can help you size time. one that will fit your operation. Because I think that that's really where the action is too. <laughs> it's all about being able to have the power i.e. the energy, to do what needs to be done in this greenhouse and hydroponic process. Right. There's a really good article, and I don't know this person who wrote the article. I'm going back to your organic thing um, that you might want to include somehow in your, on your website, and it's, uh, her name is Charlotte Bradley, and she wrote an article, Hydroponics versus Organic. Um, and I know that's not what you're talking about right now, but um, I think she says it better than anybody else in her article where she talks about how um, organic fertilizers are are difficult to, um, to get into a, a water source, how they are sometimes harmful, um, and when they're taken up, they can leave harmful residue in plants. But... Um, Hydroponic fertilizers are very specific. Um, you, they can create food with using precious natural resources and using less of them because all of it is utilized. Um, and hydroponic crops are grown in a sterile environment, much more so than an organic crop is. So in the end, what you're often producing hydroponically is a much safer product than an organic product might be. That's interesting. I never thought of it that way. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking to the founders of Crop King, Marilyn and Paul Brettlinger, and learning about hydroponics, its benefits, what it is, a little bit about its history, the confusion and complexity surrounding it. And I really want to thank you for taking your time today to be on the show. For anybody that wants to get a hold of Crop King who is either a farmer or wants to set up a hydroponic system, you can go to cropking.com. What is the phone number there? Um, Our phone number is 330-302-4203, or our 800 number is 800-321-5656. I want to thank you both for being here today, and I hope that you'll come back and talk to us. Thank you. Sure, thank you.